Um, I want to thank Magali Anderson for joining us tonight. It's really a pleasure to have you here and I'm really excited about it, about being able to learn from you and about uh, having a conversation after your, um, after your presentation. Um, our guest tonight is the Chief Sustainability Officer at uh, Lafarge Holzin. Um, she's a mechanical engineer and um, started her career in the field um, as a field engineer for, on offshore oil rigs in Nigeria. Um, she spent 27 years in the oil and gas industry. And um, she has, uh, during her career, she has also held several functional roles, including uh, vice president of marketing and sales and vice president of shared services organization for the for Europe and Africa region. Uh, and the global uh, head of maintenance. Um, in 2016, she joined Lafarge Holtzim as the group head of health and safety. And as of 2019, uh, she was appointed as a member of the group executive committee at Lafarge Holtzim. Um, so I would keep that introduction uh, short so that I can give the words to our guests. Thank you very much for having us, for being here. Thank you, Mariana. So thank you for the introduction. Um, what I suggest is I go straight to my slides. I've prepared a few slides. Uh, I will try to, I will go fast on the slides. So don't hesitate to stop me, maybe, uh, you know, either by talking or putting a big hand like this. Um, if you feel I'm going too fast on the slide, I do it on purpose because I would prefer to keep time for discussion than times for uh, slides. I think it's more interesting. So if you get frustrated, if you want more information on slides, please just stop me. So now let's see how good I am at doing the sharing game. And I put it on presentation mode. Here we are. You can all see my screen? Yeah, okay, so I will go. I don't see all of you. So it's better you talk if you want to stop me because I might not see you. I, when, when I share the screen, I only see a few faces and I won't tell you which ones. <laughs> So, um, just a few words about La Farge Holcim, just a few facts. And um, I think the particularity of La Farge Holcim is the geographical spread, 75 countries, a big presence in Middle East Africa, in India, Latin America, North America, and of course Europe. 2,300 operating sites, some big cement sites, of course, but also a lot of little concrete sites. 72,000 employees and about 27 billion sales. Um, the second row and the third row, I won't go through it because this is more of a general slide. And the reason why I won't go through it is because there's plenty of slides after. So like that, I don't need to repeat myself. And, um, but few, few of the fun facts which are uh, compared to our industry is, uh, and you might not know, so you might learn something today. Concrete is the second most used material in the world after water. Um, and in the next 30 to 40 years, we expect about 2 billion people moving to urban areas. 60% of that infrastructure doesn't exist. So we are talking about buildings equivalent of New York City every month. Another reference I actually prefer is that we are going to build Paris every, every week. Um, and that's 1.6 billion people today, in addition to all these people I was talking about, another 1.6 billion people do not have proper housing. So needless to say, concrete is a very useful material um, and will be useful for the next 30, 40 and way beyond years. As a, as a company, um, I think what was important, and this is really um, something obviously I've been working on, but of course, as a company, we didn't start uh, one year ago, we started way before, but I think it will, it's important to, to have a purpose. And really our purpose is to, work, to shape a world that is greener, smarter, and works for everyone. And this is you know, back to the previous slides in terms of providing uh, infrastructure housing to everybody from the big cities all the way to, to affordable houses. Um, we have, of course, a, a, a strategy which is building for growth, but it's important to understand that sustainability is fully embedded in that strategy. And that, uh, of course, we, we are leading the way today. I say, of course, it's not that, of course, but compared to our competitors of similar size or, or similar uh, international, 
we are clearly leading the way in the green construction. Um, we want to be at the next frontier of technology, and I will talk about it a bit after. I have some more slides here, and of course, affordable housing and essential infrastructures. Um, so when I say talking, uh, when I was talking about building a web that works for everybody, um, so we have, uh, I'm just get, going to say a few words here about a, a project we have, which is called 14 Trees. And we make houses with bricks called Dura Bricks. And it's called 14 Trees. It, it's a collaboration with a UK um, uh, big NGO or not, it's not an NGO, it's governmental. I think it's called CDC, but anyway, don't quote me on that. Um, and basically is to make houses that uh, are affordable. And the way we make them is we use um, one of our product directly, of course, to, to, to the local material, but we don't need to cook it. We don't need to cook the bricks. So for the making of one house, we save 14 trees, hence the name. Um, so not only is affordable, it's uh, a house, a, a family house like that would be costing less than 10,000 uh, pounds, um, but it's green. It's uh, because we don't have to burn them. We are um, having a, a lot of pilots in, uh, in Malawi at the moment, but the idea is to work also with uh, micro credit banks so that we can find, um, even if we make it as cheap as possible, we still need to help people um, to find a way to finance it. And by the way, one of the reasons why it's so cheap is because we, man we have been uh, qualified to give carbon credits on those bricks. And those carbon credits we reduce, allows us to reduce the price of, of the, the, what we sell. Um, on, on the communities, we, like I said, we are in, uh, in 75 countries, but what's particular about our industry or uh, our company, I would say more than our industry, is most of our cement plants are quite often really at the middle of nowhere in, in Middle East Africa, in India, etc. And what it means is means that uh, when you are uh, when you are there, we are the only industrial employer of the entire community. So our community duties goes way beyond just giving a job to people. Um, we need to develop people. We have schools. We have. Uh, um, hospitals and those hospitals quite often take care of uh, the communities because that's the closest they have to their home. Um, I think last year we we took care of about 250,000 people who were not either our workers or their dependent, who were members of the community, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, um, I as you notice, I, I didn't stop my speech like everyone does at the moment talking about COVID. And I won't talk about COVID because I'm sure you are you all hear a lot about COVID. But of course, that special position we have, we had a very big role to play when it came to COVID, and we could help more than four million people um, during the crisis, which is still ongoing, by the way. Um, and then I will go straight to innovation, and I think. Um, we talk here about innovating to build more with less. And that's something that I get quite regularly. So to be really sustainable, at the end, what we want to do is more with less. And people say, but how does that work in terms of a business model? And this is where really we're talking about transiting from a volume business model to a performance business model. <coughs> Sorry. So what you see at the top here, <coughs> sorry about that is a 3D printing of, um, of the foot of, the, of a windmill. <clears throat> Sorry, trying doing my best here. So it allows to make a much taller windmill, again, with less concrete. And it, it does make uh, the windmill gain something like 40 to 45% in terms of electricity of output. So it's, it's a complete win-win. Um, but also when we look at, uh, at uh, digitalization, uh, we have something called Transportation Analytics Center, which is uh, based in India today. And we, we transport our material either from the quarry all the way to the, to the plant, but also the cement bags to our client or the concrete uh, trucks to also our clients. That represent more than 2 billion, 2 billion, kilometers per year. 
which makes us one of the biggest transportation company in the world. Um, that's about 100,000 trucks on the road at any given time. And we monitor today more than 60% of these trucks. So we have a, a, what we call IBMS, in, um, internal vehicle monitoring system, which allows to monitor. So that's, I think it's pretty clear what you can do with that in terms of organizing your network, where you should position your warehouse, uh, organizing the different trips, but also looking at going from um, truck to train to waterways. So in terms of CO2 reduction, uh, today, uh, I'm assuming you are familiar with COP123. So if you are not, make big signs, no, we are not, and I will explain. So today, it really allows us to address our COP3, which is a value chain, 50% um, of our COP3 being transportation. So reducing the CO2 of the transportation is something now we can do thanks to digitalization of, um, of all our transportation. And again, considering the numbers, it was not an easy thing. Magali, I, I, Magali, I think it would be good to quickly summarize what scope one, two, and three is. Just uh, not everyone is from the system. Okay. <laughs> sure. So scope one is um, our own operation. So that's basically the heating up of the kiln and the process for the limestones to, to become clinker that then becomes uh, cement. Scope two is energy, that the electricity above my head, but also the electricity to to power up the secondary equipment in our cement plant. And scope three is the rest of the value chain, procurement, clients, so. So in most companies, um, let's say, let's take a, a, a industry such as oil and gas, the scope three would be enormous because that should be the usage of the fuel they sell. So it's not so much producing the fuels that create, that produce CO2 is, is when you use it. So their scope three is enormous. Uh, compared to the scope one and two. In our case, our scope three represents only 13% of our total emission. And when I say only between brackets, because it's still 19, 20 million tons of CO2, so it's still huge. And that's why um, when it's below 40%, science-based target initiative does not ask you to have a roadmap to zero for it. They ask you to concentrate on your scope one and two. But because of the amount of CO2 that we emit on our scope three, um, I took the decision this year that when we revamped our strategy that we should also address scope three. But I believe we are the first one in our sectors to actually publicly come up with, uh, with not only a roadmap, but targets, et cetera. In terms of innovation, um, so we have about 300 researchers in, the, in our global network. Um, well, I won't read the, the numbers here, you can read them yourself, <laughs> but it's what is interesting is half of the innovation projects today are on the low carbon solution. So um, I work a lot with our uh, innovation uh, leader and, and all the innovation people because we looked at the products, processes, etc. Um, and about 40% of our, of our patents now are related to low carbon solution. So, it's really, um, we have to look at how to make, no, we look at noble cements using calcium clay, et cetera. But also uh, once you have a noble cement and you put uh, steel inside for, for reinforcement, if your pH has changed, what will be the, direct, what is going to happen to your steel after a certain amount of time, how long, long would it stay, et cetera, et cetera. So, so that's the type of thing we do. They have some super cool projects. I love going to Lyon, um, visiting all these new things they do. Digitalization, I think the biggest thing I should talk about here is plants of tomorrow. And um, where we, we've been working with, uh, with startups or by ourselves on um, basically improving the production across our um, sector. Of course, um, we have plants of all kinds of ages. So we have plants that are more than 100 years old, some that are much more recent. So that we will not be progressing at the same speed all across uh, our plants. But today, basically the, the, the luxury we have is to have an enormous playground. We have all these plants we can play with. So we basically um, do proof of concept plant by plant of the different technology. And then after we will be replicating. So we can like that accelerate how quickly we go on our plants of tomorrow. A lot of it is on maintenance. Uh, as you can imagine, a cement plant, the maintenance part is uh, doing predictive maintenance, not just reduce your cost a lot, but also 
increase your, your mean time between failure, which is for us one of the big indicators. Um, I will say a few words about the foundation. So we have a foundation which was uh, starting in 2003 and does uh, Lafarge Holcim Award. So I should actually let uh, Philip talk about that because he knows he's been involved in the foundation uh, for many years. Um, and uh, it's, it's a, basically what we do, you have awards, you have a forum, you have the next generation lab, but I think what is really, what I find incredible myself about this foundation is the network and um, the, the, how rich um, having all these people, all these people from on the five continents from all different backgrounds, but all expert in, uh, in uh, sustainable construction, uh, getting together, such as the forum, for example, this is an incredible source of ideas and, and um, new, um, new solutions. Um, and it's, uh, it's um, the, the world itself, the competition itself is actually well known within the architect world. So today, <clears throat> today I was told when you're an architect, sorry, <coughs> I, I always say I talk too much. Today, I was told when you're an architect, there are three competitions you need to go to. One is Pfizer, one is uh, Aga Khan, and we are the third one. <clears throat> so those are the research and practice grants that were you saw before, part of the foundation. Uh, in addition to that, we finance uh, two chairs, including one in ETH. We, we finance also 40 PhD around the world and we have a global network of academic uh, relationship again all around the world. Uh, we made an announcement of uh, adding one in, in China only last week and we will be about to announce uh, collaboration with a big one in the US uh, very soon. <clears throat> so I wanted to put that, and it's actually a movie. So instead of trying to click on the link and get the movie, I have opened it, um, sorry, I've opened it here. It's something called Bubble Buyer. So I don't know if you ever heard of it, but let me put it bigger. Here we are. So it's a small movie. It does... we, we don't see it, Magali. It's on your other screen, probably. Ah, sorry. Well, now you are challenging me. How do I do that? Um, it might so I'm going to stop sharing this one and reshare, and that certainly will be easier. Can you see it now? Okay, great. So don't worry about the sound, it's just a horrible music they put. But it's called Bubble Barrier. And what you see here is a river with plastic going down. And they are going to put the bubble barrier and guess what, the plastic will be diverted. But the beauty of it is that as it's only bubbles, uh, the plastic is being diverted. However, uh, fishes can continue to go through boats, etc. And then what you are left to do is just collect the plastic at the end and, um, and have it, uh, you know, then bring it to our plant to be co-processed. <clears throat> so like that, you will have a, a video about co-processing. Like I said, you just need to read the text. It will be better than trying, me trying to put the, um, but why I wanted to show you that is because actually the video does not show how the bubble barrier is made, but the way the bubble barrier is made, it's a piece of steel. It's as simple as that with the compressor sending air, a piece of steel with holes, compressor sending heads. And so let me sh stop sharing now and go back to my presentation. <clears throat> Sorry, I need to go back on presentation mode. Here we are. So I, I really like it because in terms of technology, it's about as basic as it gets, right? 
you are talking about a piece of steel, some holes in it, a compressor sending air, and that's it. Then, of course, you need to have all the logistics that goes around it. You need to have a place where you can collect the plastic. You need to have something you can do with the plastic. But I love that example because we could do it tomorrow everywhere. We have two pilots ongoing. It's actually an open source innovation. It doesn't come from us. And I just wanted to highlight on something I was discussing with Mariana when we prepared that sometimes innovation can be extremely basic. It's more on the processes on how you implement it everywhere, but you can do a lot um, by, by something that is technology-wise completely you know, super basic, which means you can not only is super cheap, very easy to replicate, very easy to reproduce, and you can put it everywhere in the world. So we have two pilots. I forgot the first one, but the second one is in India. Um, actually, what is taking the longest is to get the permits from the country. Anyway, let's go to sustainability now that I've talked about a lot of things. So this is a bit of a timeline of what has happened over the last year. And I think it's fair to say that we've been doing a lot in La Fashion Sim over the last 20, 30 years. Uh, we have reduced our emission of CO2 by 27% since 1990, but there have been a true acceleration last year. And the acceleration is not so much me coming in the job, it's more putting sustainability at the executive committee level, which means putting basically sustainability at the heart of the decision-making of the company. And that was really the main change that um, Jan and the board decided to do. And well, when you have that, that means you have all the resources. You are not anymore a side function doing things on the side. You are completely involved and embedded in everything we do. So since we've done that, um, you can read, we joined the WBCSD call for action for human rights. Uh, we ranked number one on system analytics, et cetera, et cetera. But I think of course uh, the big one, the one I'm the most proud of is um, we signed the net zero pledge with science-based target. And for me, <clears throat> so a lot of companies, as you know, signed the net zero pledge and there is always a big debate. Is it greenwashing? Is it true? Is it real? How they're going to do it, especially a company which is uh, as um, um, part of the hard to abate sector like us. I don't know if some of you made the calculation earlier. I said 19 million tons, 13%. I don't know if you calculated how many million tons we emit, but it's about 140, 150 million tons, depending if you go gross or net. Um, it's a huge amount of CO2 at the company that we emit. So for me, it was clear that we couldn't just do a step change. We had to do a, a, true, um, a true revolution. That's how I call it. So um, the, the first, um, and, and I will, let me continue with it. So the, this is a, what the pledge is about. So it's on our scope one. And now you all know that scope one is our own emission, which is 82% of our emission. Um, so the first one, and this is, um, it's a relative value. We look at CO2 for us in our sector as kilogram of CO2 per ton of cementitious. So we don't look at absolute value because that's how we compare ourselves to, to the rest of the sector. Um, and what we committed with our pledge is to reach, so we are at 561 right now. Um, we had a target for 2022 and now our 2030 target is to go to 475, which is record breaker for, for our industry. But what was important was to have it endorsed with SBTI. So I don't know if you ever heard of SBTI, Science Based Target Initiative, but it's, a, it's an NGO that is now has positioned itself as a reputable organization to um, validate your target. So you go with them and they validate the fact that you follow the 1.5 degree scenario. So you can't anymore go and say, I will reach 500 and I am on 1.5 degree. So, for me, it was extremely important to, to have the SBTI validation. Again, as we said earlier, I'm an engineer. So for me, it's doing it the right way was important. Um, one of the difficulty we got was the fact that uh, actually the, the roadmap did not exist. So we had to create it with SBTI. And now we are partnering with them to create the rest of the roadmap to go to zero. Because it, it does not exist for our sector. Um, the other, the different levers we are going to do. So this may be a detail that you don't need to go through, but what we have traditional levers such as replacing the fossil fuels that heat up the kiln, um, changing the, the clinker factor, reducing the clinker factor, et cetera. 
which will take us to our 2030 uh, objective of uh, 475. To go further, we, can, we will still continue pushing on those levers because we won't be at the end of them, but there will be a moment where we will need carbon capture storage and, and usage, which is, um, I'm sure you know that it's a very debated uh, technology because it's relatively new. Today, there's about 40 million tons captured per year, total, the world capture 40 million tons. Remember how many tons we emit, I told you. So, so the world capture less than one third of our own emission. So clearly um, it's not where it should be and no cement plant today is capturing CO2. So it's, uh, it's uh, even though they've been doing it for 50 years, there haven't been any, enough focus and enough innovation in this. Now, the good news is I think many, many people realize that we have to do it. And for example, uh, Boris Johnson two days ago announced his 10 uh, <clears throat> climate plan for UK. And one of them was uh, CCU, CCS, carbon capture storage, where he said he wanted uh, five plants before the end of the decade and he was going to finance it up to 1 billion. So our positioning here is that we need to multiply the pilots and to really um, find a way to make it work for our industry. And we have one decade to solve that paradigm. Um, it's good to have um, pledges and everything that looks always good on our website. You look at it and we have a super cool website, but at the end of the day, what's important is how do you actually implement it? How do you go to market with that? So we launched uh, only two months, only one month before the pledge, we actually launched our first, um, uh, that's the first uh, global brand of low carbon um, concrete. We, are, we will launch, I hope before the end of the year, the equivalent for cement. And we also launched three weeks ago our eco label, which is a label you can put in each country if you are 30% below the, the level of CO2 of uh, the country. <clears throat> circular economy. So, circular economy, another huge topic for us. I mean, if we, if we want to be less CO2, we need to be more circular. Um, something that is not very well known about us is that we, we co-processed or recycled or upcycled, it all depends which part of the waste we are talking about, almost 50 million tons of waste. To put things in perspective, the biggest waste company is Veolia, they are at 49 million tons, so we are as big as Veolia. Some of our geocycle people who are the one in charge of that, they like to say we are a waste treatment company that does cement as a, as a byproduct. Okay, it's not really the case, but I think it's very important. Um, we have 2 million tons of, so we, we follow the hierarchy of waste. So the, the plastic that we put in our uh, kiln or in, in the burning to um, replace fossil fuels is, is plastic that cannot be recycled anymore. It's at its end of life, right? We don't, um, again, we follow, it's very important that our co-processing procedure follow the hierarchy of waste. But if you think that um, there's 8 million tons of plastic that ends up in the ocean every year, 2 million tons gives you a bit, put things in perspective of what it is in terms of quantity. Um, and that's my last slide. <laughs> so let me go back. I think I've stopped sharing now. Yes, you have. Thank you very much for this uh, insightful presentation. Um, to be quite honest, you've answered so many of the questions that I had prepared for our talk together I that I'm not sure where to even begin. So this is fan <laughs> really fantastic. Um, I um, I think it's uh, it gave a very nice um, overview of um, all of the um, all of the challenges and all of the different facets of Lafarge Holstein in this case, because usually I guess and maybe I'm just speaking for myself, but usually the way um, everybody sees this is as the big concrete company and as we don't necessarily always think of all the other things that um, come with it at that particular scale um, and all of the um, implications on a social and economical level um, that uh, that you have to deal with every day. Um, so it was really insightful and it gave also quite a, um, a nice um, insight into how you view sustainability. Um, so I wanted to um, to pick it up from there just as a, a first question, more of a summary, but um, as, an, as, as a small um, 
phrase of um, what is Lafarge Holtzin definition of, of sustainability? And does that um, change across the different sectors um, or the scope of activities? So for the uh, production and the um, versus a service or for geographical locations? Um, so I'm not sure if there is a, a true definition. You know, we are actually working with um, on redefining the purpose of the company in terms of wording. But I think what's important, what we really want to do is to shift from being that bad concrete company, you know, that could be in some people's mind to we are part of the solution. And I think that's what we are trying to do at the company and obviously with the support of sustainability. And if you think of the we are part of the solution, um, we are part of the solution. Some of the things I showed here in terms of um, how the 50 million tons of waste that I was just talking about, if we were not reusing it or recycling it or upcycling it, they would end up in landfill. Um, if you look at uh, construction of renewable energy, whatever renewable energy you, you, you would like to use, you are going to need concrete to do it. Um, if you look at protection of shores, and we know about the raising of the water, you need concrete. Development of infrastructure, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think, I think moving our image to we are part of the solution, it's, it's, it's become my, uh, it has become my buzz word, if I can call it that way. And that's almost an hashtag I would like to use everywhere. But I would say if we had to define a purpose, that's a very small word, that's how I would define it. In addition to, can you see behind me? Uh, building for people and planet. <laughs> of course. <laughs> yes. Um, that, that is definitely a very, um, a very holistic approach um, and, um, and probably the only way to go really for a, for a company this large. And probably even though you, you did mention that uh, one way to tackle this was to bring sustainability at the heart of, of the decision making so that it's not just a, a side um, project that always fights up the ladder. <laughs> Um, I was wondering what are some of the challenges that you do face as a company or as a decision uh, or even as the decision makers when you try to balance these uh, these issues and being part of the uh, the solution with uh, maybe stakeholders or uh, or others that um, um, that are involved in this or that might be external to uh, to the company itself and how does that balance? So, well as you use the word stakeholder I would take that opportunity to say when um, when we did the, the, um, the pledge, the internal stakeholders' uh, reaction from our people was incredibly positive, overwhelmingly positive. That was because I think people want to work for companies they are proud of. They want to be proud of the companies they work for. They want us to have a purpose and that we are giving them back that purpose. You, as I'm sure you, some of you know the history of Lafarge or Sim, Lafarge or Sim, Merger. Etc. So it's, it's been a bit rocky time for a lot of our employees. So finding a new purpose and the new leadership of, of Jan, who only been CEO for three years, I think that really was great. Now, when it comes to the others, you know, at the end, um, um, on, on my background, I don't know if you noticed, but I spent most of my life as a business person. So I'm coming from the business world. I was CEO of a country for total operation. I've been a p &L, uh, owner for many, many years. So I speak operation, I speak business. And I think what is absolutely key when you have a role like mine, if you are a super expert and you speak expert to business people, you don't understand each other. It doesn't work. I promise you. <laughs> so I do have, by the way, super experts in my teams, of course, because I need the experts. But you need them to translate that in business language. And, and if you want to make sustainability sustainable, the only way to really make it is when business understand it's a win-win situation. And <clears throat> so there is a, a change of mindset. Well, first of all, you need to make sure in terms of cost. So the, I was talking about traditional levers. So the first 10 years until 2030 to reach our 475, um, our traditional levers are actually economically very viable. Viable, sorry, not viable, viable. So what it means is, uh, for example, one of them, which is what we call TSR, thermal substitution rate, where we replace fossil fuel by waste, where we, re we replace something that costs money by something where we get money for. So that 
We have um, plants with uh, negative energy cost today. Of course, there is an investment because you need to put all kind of filters. If not, the people are not so happy when we emit uh, dirty things. Um, but overall, that's a return on investment of about three years, two years sometimes. And it makes us less dependent of energy cost. So when you talk that language to business, they love it. You know, that's, that's a, a, a language they can talk. So I think um, a lot of the thing we do actually is a good win-win. Now, the other, so, so the first one is the cost of our product. How much is that impacting the cost of our product? Most of the traditional levers will have um, either zero cost impact or very little cost impact. And then there is a price. And this is where the development of our EcoPack branding was so important, is how do you get a premium pricing on selling low carbon products? And again, it's something, when I got in my job, everyone was telling me, Magali, there's no market. No one wants to buy green product, no one cares, because we deal with the procurement of those big construction companies that just want the lowest price. So, so maybe it was true one year and a half ago. In the meantime, many things happened, such as the EU Green Deal, et cetera, et cetera. And if you think that 40% of our um, output uh, goes to the public sector, because it's infrastructure construction, um, if, if in the public sector, they start putting limits to the CO2 of the of their project in their tendering phase, then, then we are winning. If uh, some of our big clients, such as Buig or Vinci, et cetera, decide to pledge for net zero, now that you all understand scope one, two, three, 70% of their CO2 spend is in their scope three. We are their scope three. So they need us to lower so they can do their pledge. So again, I'm winning. So we will, it, it's still quite early stage for sure. No question about that. I am not going to tell you that I'm selling millions of tons of EcoPack as of today, but um, we are monitoring. We have now deployed EcoPack in most of Europe, North America, Latin America. We just made an announcement on it. And, um, but India is, is starting looking at it and the Middle East Africa as well. Some countries start looking at it. And I think we really, I truly believe there is a, a, a market for uh, construction products such as concrete for market premium for low carbon concrete. And by the way, the, the cost of concrete over an overall construction is, is, a pre, is a very minimum part, right? It's in the one digit, it's three, four percent. So even if you have a price premium of 10 to 15 percent, it still won't impact your construction costs that heavily. Okay, well, thank you very much for that answer. It's a uh, it's long very... answer to a short question, sorry. <laughs> No, but it's fantastic. We get a lot of insight um, out of uh, out of these answers. Um, it, it is safe. It, it is safe to uh, to say that it's um, it, it's clear that the perceptions of sustainability have definitely um, and public awareness have definitely um, done something um, to this. Um, I I was wondering if we could um, maybe have a look at the social uh, at the social part of things because. Um, also in your presentation, something that you mentioned that I found very interesting is saying that um, you work sometimes in, uh, you have power plants in very remote locations where uh, Lafarge Holtz is then the only, um, the only means um, or the only work giver uh, there. So there is a, a certain um, social um, responsibility um, in many ways. So how do you think um, innovation could improve the work or the health and safety um, or security and quality of life for, um, for the people involved in, the, in these industries. Um, and I would maybe extend that question to how um, it, it is clear that you are supporting the training for these kind of, uh, for these uh, types of workers. And I was going to uh, ask how, um, how you do that. So, I will first talk about some of our product and the impact outside, and then I will come to our people. There's a product I love, which is called Agrovia, and um, I will give you a project which happened in Ecuador. And actually we did, uh, we use Agrovia to do the roads in, in the Galapagos, but which is also in Ecuador, obviously, but there's another project which I absolutely love because it's, I call it the banana project. And I love it because I exchange emails with people and it's the title of the email is banana project. So you never do that in business world, I tell you. <laughs> and what it is, is it's a product. So you need a, a special machinery, but you, 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 um, 
mix it with your natural ground. You don't have to bring any new ground. You don't have to do asphalt. And you do a road, a rural road, which is as, as resilient as uh, asphalt road. When cost seven to ten times less, but also much less polluting. You don't need to to bring uh, um, resources, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. You just need to invest in the machine. Now, what that does? Why did I call it the banana project? It's because they, they did it for banana plantation. So the banana plantation they could only use them six months a year because during the rainy season the the um, pathway were too damaged, so they couldn't go there. So now they can exploit it the full year round. But also they can, um, the, the, the way to market of the banana, they were losing about 20% of it because of the road being all bang, bang. And now they have no more loss of production. So the, this type of thing, and, and if you can think of whole roads, you can think of kids going to school, you can think of you know, uh, access to, to medical care and all the things. And, and I think it's, a, so in our uh, social pillar, uh, I'm now pushing to look at this type of solutions, which is part of our DNA. That's who we are, what we do, but also we can really help in develop infrastructure in, in countries where it's well needed. Now, if we come to health and safety, it's plenty of things. You know, we are a big heavy industry, but let's talk of drones. So we are now, so you all know drones. Drones allow, help us to do um, inventory of stock of our quarries, et cetera. That's the easy thing. They help us to do uh, the evaluation of the status of our silos, you know, if it's cracking, et cetera, instead of sending people walking 100 meters high. The last one, and we've had several accidents on that, is we have now drones that can go inside silos, inside uh, confined space with dust. And that uh, the technology is such that despite that, we can still do a complete inspection. It's, it's actually completely amazing to see. I was so impressed. So it's a small startup and uh, we are starting to buy a lot of their drones. I think now they are fully dedicated to us. Um, then of course, there's a lot of robotics. There's a lot of, um, um, you know, just something as simple as palletizer where it sounds basic, but in a lot of Middle East Africa country or India, we don't have them because the cost of the palletizer is not compensated by the cost of people. So we still have people loading bags and trucks manually. So there is all these things that we can do. Um, we look a lot of artificial intelligence and, and improvement of the process again, which will help uh, preserving the people in terms of uh, when you do preventive maintenance is something I push a lot because when, when um, you have a failure and a non a react, I'm not sure how you call it. Uh, I used to be VP maintenance, I should know that. Um, and you have a, a you know a, mat, a failure just like that, well it it becomes big panic, right? You can imagine a kiln stopping, the the panic that happens, and this is where accidents happen because you don't take the right time, you, and this is where you become unsafe. So this is very important, and um, I will talk about the the last one, which is um, I talked about TAC and TAC uh, Transportation Analytics Center. It's very useful as well for because we use it to, to monitor the driving of our drivers and to coach them. So the coaching of the drivers via the monitoring of the driver via the um, IBMS in, inside vehicle monitoring system they have in their trucks. Uh, it's thanks to that that we have reduced our uh, road fatalities by a factor of five in four years by, by monitor training, but monitoring the behavior of the driver, not so much over speeding, more the harsh braking, harsh except um, harsh accelerating, which shows that the guy doesn't know how to drive, for example. So you can coach him, train him, or stop him from driving if he's really too dangerous. And I met with Volvo as it was last week, and we are looking at automated um, dumpers on quarries. So again, this is all technology that is advancing as fast as we speak, you know. Um, we haven't. We we are uh, working with them to start the first quarry. We'll be in Switzerland. I hope I will be able to visit it in in six months. So we'll have the first uh, pilot model. But this is incredible because once you remove the drivers, you have a lot of safety. Um, going back to your training question, uh, I won't go into virtual training, etc. There is thing that we are um, not me, but uh, Cement Excellence is working on virtual training. I'm not too sure how far they are. Uh, but I think um, in, in a lot of uh, in those geographies that I was mentioning, 
there is no university or oh, university um it's not university but uh, technician school next to to us so so basically we would develop uh, skills like uh, being electrician mechanic this type of skills but technician level for our plant um i was in india it was quite funny they had the class of electrician so it's a one year course and it's a proper development it's not just it's a proper training so they had the electrician full of uh, Men student, then mechanic full of men student, and then there was a class full of female student. I was like, oh, what is that? Oh, we also do beautician training. <laughs> I was like, what? So yeah, yeah, because women can do electrician or mechanic, so we do. So I, I gave them my peace of mind on the topic. <laughs> now they have female student also on mechanic and electronic and electric. Um, so, but this is really pretty much depending on the countries where we are. In a, in a lot of countries, we actually don't have, um, if we don't have the talent pool where we are, we need to bring people, not from another country, but from another city, and that can be quite complex. So it's our interest to develop them, but also we develop much more than, than we need. So they, we don't necessarily recruit everybody, they can go and work for other industries. Again, long, long answer to a short question. <laughs> Sorry. Well, thank, you. thank you very much, it's very insightful. Um, as we're in the last, 15 minutes of the schedule, I wanted to open it up um, for, for the audience to ask, uh, to ask any questions. Um...